Sounds good. Uh, so, Jay, I'm sorry. How do you pronounce your, the last name? It's it's one syllable. Hakes. It rhymes with bakes or cakes. Great. And um, so you've obviously been involved in energy for for quite a while. Um, I was curious to just kind of get a little bit of a, of a background. I, I know you've put together a couple of books. You said you worked for um, a couple of uh, presidential administrations as well. Yeah, I go back to Jimmy Carter. Uh, I mean, I was actually at his uh, 75th wedding anniversary in Plains, Georgia, a few weeks ago. And uh, one of my jobs was at the Interior Department, where um, we had some energy responsibilities. And uh, then the 1980s, I was the state energy director for Florida. Uh, and then in the 90s, in the Clinton administration, I headed the uh, US Energy Information Administration, uh, did a lot of testimony before Congress. And then I went down and was head of the Jimmy Carter Presidential Library, but I took a leave of seven months to work on President Obama's investigation of the VP oil spill. And, um, and then I'd already written one book by that point. And uh, now I, I wrote a second one that came out uh, in April and I'm now working on a third on climate change. <laughs> nice. Um, I, so I'm, I'm curious from your perspective, our, I know the US economy has, has you know, is directly tied to the burning of fossil fuels. I feel like those two are, you know, are, are, are pretty intertwined. Um, and it seems like there has been a slow but steady transition toward clean energy. Does that, does that seem to have pick, picked up steam in the last few years? Well, it started picking up steam about 2007. I mean, you know, fossil fuels themselves replaced other fuels like uh, whale oil and wood and, and human beings pushing plows and horses and uh, oxen and everything else. Uh, so, you know, for years we, we had sort of non-fossil options, whether it was nuclear or wind or solar and they didn't seem to be going anywhere very fast. In about 2007, the price starts coming down on wind and solar quite a bit. And that momentum has been uh, going pretty strong. If we'd started it 20 years earlier, which I think we could have if we'd pushed it more, uh, we'd be in a lot better shape today. But we are you know, headed in the direction of a low carbon grid and we're also headed in the direction of having uh, electricity supply a lot of things like uh, power for automobiles uh, that used to use fossil fuels. So I think we're headed in the right direction. We're just not headed there fast enough to uh, stave off these things that we're seeing and are already kind of baked in the pie to get worse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What were some of your um, initial reactions when the, the latest IPCC report came out? Well, I think it told us, you know, the basic outlines of this, we've kind of known since the late 1970s. Um, and I, I'm right now working on my next book in the early 1980s, and they're talking about the dehydration of the, of the Western states and the Colorado River and the kind of things that lead to fires. But this one just really kind of knocked it out of the park in terms of looking at all the alternate theories. You know, some people say, well, it's sunspots or it's uh, volcano dust. And, and those, you know, can affect climate and temperature. But what they showed that over time, they, they don't explain what's going on now. So that the only real explanation is, is the standard one that we're uh, emitting greenhouse gases, which is mainly carbon dioxide, but other things like methane. And it, it just, to me, kind of was the final nail. Now, scientists are very careful about their language and they hate to use uh, uh, you know, words like certainty, but th they just said it was beyond question <laughs> that, that humans were changing the climate. And um, you know, I think they could have said that earlier, but, uh, but now they've just, you know, been very clear. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. So maybe it's that they see such a sense of urgency with the need to change before a certain amount of people are impacted, uh, you know, more significantly, um, that they had to change the language. And, um, you know, you were, you know, obviously write about energy as well as policy, um, and, you know, there, there have been reports, it's pretty public that, you know, ExxonMobil, for example, knew that 
burning fossil fuels warms the atmosphere, yet they continued to, you know, push people burning fossil fuels, how much um, involvement do they have with political parties in order to prevent a transition to cleaner energy? Well, I mean, Exxon knew in the 1950s, um, but so did a lot of other people. I mean, I, you know, the, there was testimony before the U.S. Congress in the 1950s about the climate change problem. And Exxon wields, uh, wields a lot of power, uh, both politically, and they, they often hire some of the top scientists in the country to work for their company. So these people have influence. So um, we've had you know, the knowledge, I think, to do a lot more than we've done. But this is a tough political issue because look at it from the standpoint point from a politician who's usually elected to a two-year term or a six-year term if they're a senator. Uh, it, nothing that we do in the next year is going to be observable pro or con uh, in the next few years because carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere for uh, over 100 years. And, and, and mass, particularly water, stores heat. So in one sense, we're doing this almost more for our grandchildren or our children, uh, and if we're young, uh, for ourselves. So from a political standpoint, there's probably a never, never a day where you say, well, this can't wait another couple of days. And um, it, you know, the fact that it has these long-term impacts is actually, in my mind, an argument why we should start sooner and not later. <laughs> uh, but it doesn't look that way from a political standpoint. And um, it, you know that it, you can take almost any news day, even the day the IPC, uh, IPCC report came out, it probably wasn't even the top news story of the day because there's, you know, the Senate is acting or somebody's investigating something. And one of the great scientists of climate change, Roger Rebell, the, the man who really started modern science, he said it's like a glacier and it just moves a little bit <laughs> each day that you hardly notice it. But then when you look at it in broad historical context, the change is, is very large if the glacier is growing or contracting. So uh, I, I think it's a challenge for all of us to say this needs sustained effort uh, it involves improving technologies, so we don't can't just push a button today and say, okay, we've solved that problem. It's like we have to solve it today, and then we have to solve it again tomorrow, and um, uh, and keep the 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 kind of technological research that advances these technologies, plus uh, rules and regulations that uh, kind of force it into the market. Uh, you can't just sort of wait back and let the market decide because there's in, uh, environmental issues involved, even to some extent, national security issues involved. So there has to be a role for government. Mm -hmm. What, um, it, you know, it's, it's, I've heard going uh, from, you know, President Trump's policies into, um, you know, President Biden policy, it seems literally night and day for, um, for the environment, uh, you know, as we look back uh, so far in the Biden administration, what have been some of the takeaways from your standpoint? Well, let's take one thing like methane. You know, carbon dioxide is the main greenhouse gas, but methane is a very interesting gas. And it has some challenges, but it has some real opportunities. Uh, the opportunity is methane, besides being a polluting fuel, can be burned as gas. And so if you are leaking it or uh, wasting it, uh, you're losing an economic resource. Plus, methane doesn't stay in the atmosphere quite so long. So what I said about carbon dioxide doesn't really apply so much to methane. So if we start chopping that right now, we're going to see results in a few, few years. It really gives us extra time. So in the previous administration, they uh, got rid of the methane uh, regulations that uh, President Obama had put in. And the question would be, why? Uh, a lot of the, the energy companies said, yeah, we, we can do this uh, and we should do it. A and it, it was definitely going to be a tremendous setback to the environment. It was hard to argue what the real gain of it was for anybody. So now those rules you know, are being put back into place. And so uh, there's an effort to try to uh, reverse that momentum that was there for a while. 
Uh, and then you, it has to move rapidly. Um, we have to, one, be moving in the right direction, and then we have to move there at a more rapid pace. And, you know, there's a lot of people studying this, and nobody wants to ruin the economy, and, uh, and no one is, uh, well, I shouldn't say no one, but, but most people, like myself, are not proposing things uh, th that are, are, are going to cause uh, great disruption. Uh, but, you know, if you have to pay a little bit for a cleaner environment, see, if you clean up the greenhouse gas pollution, you're also cleaning up other forms of pollution that cause asthma and uh, other problems. So as you move away from fossil fuels, uh, there's a lot of health and other benefits that you, you get from that. So uh, I think we're going to look back and, and say, why didn't we start sooner? Why didn't we go faster? Uh, it's not true that we've done nothing. Uh, you know, we're driving more efficient automobiles today. Uh, most electric uh, utilities have committed to moving pretty rapidly towards uh, uh, zero carbon uh, production. So, so we're doing things. It's just to keep the, the foot on the pedal to, to do them uh, rapidly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, last question for you. What about... Um... Other countries, you know, you hear that a lot of, you know, China obviously continuing to burn coal while we are, you know, are seeing a decline in coal. India is a growing um, economy and a growing polluter as well. Um, what role does the United States have in influencing other countries to lower their carbon footprint? Well, I, I think you're right. I think India is the biggest problem. There's a lot of complaints about China and China certainly is still building coal plants, which is unfortunate. But given where they are in the economic development cycle and their low per capita use of energy, uh, China is doing some things. Uh, I've given talks in China and, and I, I, my sense is they, they know this is a problem, they're being hurt by it. India uh, you know, has pledged at times to, to help. Uh, I think we it's worth it to us to actually assist them. Um, and then, it, you know, in some ways, as you move through this, you can put penalties on countries that don't have plans. You know, uh, for instance, uh, when we import from a country, we could say, well, if there was too much uh, carbon used in producing this product, we'll put a tax on it or something like that. India gets a little bit more complicated. And um, I don't know that there's a short answer to the India problem, but um, but at times we have had agreements with India that, that they've responded to, but I have to say right now, I'm disappointed uh, with uh, the level of commitment there. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, that's pretty good for me. Is, is there anything else you, you think you'd might like to add? Well, I think uh, we shouldn't just leave this totally to government. Uh, you, you know, I think each of us, as we live our lives, there's little adjustments we can make. And, you know, if, if we're outside and the temperature is 79 degrees, we're pretty comfortable. And so if we're coming inside and we're setting it at 72 or something like that, it, it, your, your body will adjust to 79. Uh, and, and that also helps you adjust to these higher temperatures outside. So the, the body's kind of adjustable. So I think we need to rethink things a little bit about just the choices we make from day to day. And if we have a way of buying a more efficient car, a more efficient air conditioner, or using the, those things in a way that's a, a little bit less damaging. I think every little bit helps. Mm -hmm. Great. Awesome. Uh, Jay, I appreciate you um, taking the time. So have you, have you spent any time up here in Western New York, Buffalo, Rochester region? I've been up there a little bit, uh, more in my college days, I think. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I've got a lot of friends there in Albany because um, when I was energy director of Florida, uh, New York and California were the, you know, the, the states that really had the professional staff and the, the planning. And so I became very good friends with uh, a lot of the, uh, the people in state government. Uh, and I've continued those friendships over the years. But I, I don't think it's, it's, you know, I've been up there, but it's, it's I, I went back there for a college bowl competition one time when I was an undergraduate. But um, uh, yeah, I, I need to get up there more. Well, I was in the Anir Anirondacks uh, a few years ago. A friend uh, had a place up there, and by, he, he was a CEO, and he wanted to talk about energy. He says, I'll invite you up to my place and, uh, and uh, 
furnish your meals and lodging for a few days if you talk to me about energy. So that that was fun. <laughs> nice. Yeah. The Adirondacks is a great spot, especially uh, in the summer. In the winter time, it's a different beast. Yeah. <laughs> we have people in New Orleans that live there in the summer and live here in the winter. <laughs> yeah, that's probably a good idea. Cool. All right. Well, thank you, Jay, so much. I, I appreciate it and uh, have a good rest of your day. Okay. Thanks, Jim. Appreciate it.